I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed, his dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves, he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. We started walking through the book of Daniel. We know it's around 586 BC because the Babylonians have come in and they have exiled some people to Babylon. They've destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And when we turn to chapter, uh, chapter 6 of Daniel, as we continue walking through this great book of the Bible, we discover that what's happened is actually six or seven kings have been on the throne and off the throne. Time has passed. There's been a whole dynasty change. And now the Medo-Persian uh, kingdoms are now in charge. Uh, and, and so there's been a dynasty change, six or seven kings, and about 60 years have passed. So Daniel, who was probably in his middle, late teens, when we meet him at the beginning of this book, is now in his late 70s or early 80s. But, but even though time has passed, some things haven't changed. As we start looking at the passage today, if you have your Bibles, open to Daniel chapter 6. We begin with what I call a new king and a familiar story. Even though Darius is the king, even though there's been, been lots of things that have changed over time, even though Daniel's now an older person, it's a familiar story, and character transcends regime change. Daniel's character, it didn't matter who was on the throne, Daniel was the same guy. His character remained the same. To get a sense of that, join in with me in reading Daniel chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. It pleased Darius, who's now the new king, to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, and one of them was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. They become as kind of a, a leadership structure with some key leaders over groups of leaders. Now Daniel, verse 3, it says, so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Daniel's gone from the 120 to the top three, and now Darius is saying, this guy is so gifted, has so much integrity, I trust him so much, I'm going to put him in the number one place underneath me. That's quite a statement considering he's not from their land. He, does, he didn't speak their language originally. He, he's, he's learning to lead in a whole new culture. Now it's been a lifetime of serving in Babylon. What I want you to notice is that Daniel's character his work ethic and his wisdom stayed the same through the years, through the decades, through regime changes. That's just the way it goes. When we become the people God wants us to be and walk closely with Jesus, there's a continuity and consistency of character. So here's an insight. If you're a note taker, you'll see there's a place on your Shoreline app to write this down. Consistent character helps us stand strong even in discouraging times. One of the ways you can, in, in, in a discouraging time like we're walking through right now when you hit a tough time in life, you know, we're, we're talking today about how do you stand strong? How do you fight the battle of discouragement? And a lot of people are feeling that these days. Well, consistent character in yourself is a great way to stand strong even in tough times. And as I began thinking about this, I, I thought about one of our pastors. And my journey with this pastor was actually, at one point my wife came up to me years ago and she said, Kevin, have you met so-and-so? This, this one guy, a military guy, and his wife. She said, have you met this guy and his wife? He, she just said, they love Jesus. They're in the military. Uh, he's here teaching at, at, uh, at uh, NPS, and his family's here, and he's serving at Shoreline. And so I just, I, she told me about this guy who was picking up students and bringing them over for church and was, was pouring into people's lives and volunteering. While he's working and teaching, he's pouring into the lives of of young men at the, you know, in the military and, and young men and women that are coming to Shoreline Church. And I said, I, hadn't, I, didn't met him. I hadn't met him yet. And so Sherry kept saying, well, you got to meet him someday. You got to meet him someday. You've had those experiences where someone says, you got to meet this person, but it just never works out. So some time goes by, and Sherry and I are traveling from Michigan back here to California, and we had to stop over in Denver at the airport. And so we're at the, in the airport, and Sherry comes up to me. And she, we're walking towards our connecting gate, and Sherry says, hey, that guy I've been telling you about and his wife, his name is Sean, and his wife's name is Amy. She said, I want, we're going to go there. We're going to meet him right now. 
So we walked over to the gate, and I got to meet Sean Strout and his wife Amy. And, and this guy who was volunteering quietly, faithfully, pouring into the lives of young soldiers and, 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 and really just investing his time in the things of Jesus. I got to meet him, and we got talking there at the gate. We had a couple-hour layover, so we're chatting, we're talking. And at one point, I said to Sean, I said, how long do you plan on being in the military? He said, you know, I, I'm not sure. I think I've probably got a couple more years. And he would, be, he would have been, he'd be able to you know, be almost towards a full retirement. And he said, I think I've got a couple more years. And so I said, well, what, I said, what do you want to do after you're out of the military? He looked at me, and this is what he said. He said, I want to serve Jesus and serve his church. And I knew he meant it with all his heart. And I said, we got to talk some more. And we started talking. And he, he then went to Korea for two years. And we would be on a Zoom call every month talking and praying together. And then God led him here to come on our team. But that character that Sean Stroud exhibited when he was volunteering at Shoreline, helping out with young soldiers, helping out with our military ministry, that character that I encountered in the airport in Denver is the same character when Sean began working at Shoreline. And over time, Sean is now our chief of staff. He leads our staff, and every staff person on our team respects him because of his character, because he's the same person 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 8 years ago, 2 weeks ago, and I believe 10 years from now, we'll have that same character. If anything, that character becomes richer and better and more honoring to Jesus. And so we look at, we look at Daniel, and we see this person whose character just stays consistent. And, and I would ask you just to pause and think, what do people say about you? What do they say about your character? Not when you're there, but when you're not there. I mean, do, do people, when they talk about us, do they say, oh, oh, you can trust her. You can trust him with anything. Or do they say something like, you know, you got to watch out for them. They don't always, they, they really aren't really very honest. Be careful. Do people say, oh, oh, she is rock solid and reliable. Or do they say, she's kind of flaky. Well, you can count on him, or you got to be really careful. Do, do they say, oh man, she is so generous. Just has a sense of generosity, it overflows. He is so generous. Or man, they are stingy. They are, they are self-centered. You say, well, people don't talk that way. Actually, people do talk that way. <laughs> Unfortunately, people talk that way. And so what, what is our character? And our character really can be defined by how people perceive us over time. And we tend to be consistent in good character or bad character. So we continue on in the passage to what I call a test of character and passing the test. So we see a test of character for Daniel. Look with me at verse 4 of chapter 6 of Daniel. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. See, some of the leaders who were from that people group were jealous of Daniel, didn't want to be in leadership, and when they hear that he's going to become the number one guy under the king, they don't like it. So they're looking for some grounds to charge him with something. They were unable to do so. They could, not, they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. I mean, they, 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 could, they, they dug in. They tried to find something in his character that they could use against him, and they couldn't find it. Verse 5. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. They said, unless this has something to do with, with what he believes, his faith, we can't hold anything against him. So basically, we're going to try to look at his faith and manipulate Daniel because of his faithfulness to God, because we can't find anything bad in his character. And so understand, these leaders didn't like Daniel to start with. They, had, they, had, they, they felt jealous of him and the role he had. And, 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 and yet when they looked at him, they said, we can't find anything in his work, his conduct, his integrity against him, so we're going to try to use his faith against him. Wouldn't it be amazing? I mean, think about it. If somebody said, the only weakness I can find in you is your faith in Jesus. And then somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus says, that's your weakness, is that you have this belief in God, this faith in Jesus, this commitment to the word of God. I would love it if somebody said, boy, when I look at Kevin, I don't see any character defects except for that crazy Jesus thing that he's all about. That's, that's, where, that's where his weakness is. I'd be okay with that. The problem is for most of us, there's other things in our character we have to search, and, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit do that today. We're going to say, God, check my heart. Check my character. If there's things in my character that are consistently unhealthy over time, Lord, deal with that, reveal it, and show it to me. 
What if people looked at you and said, the only thing I can accuse you of is the fact that you believe that this book is true. See, for some people, that, 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 that's, oh, they're one of the Bible, they believe the Bible's true. You know, you're, you're, you're a caveman or a cavewoman. You're not, you're, not, you're not scientific. You're not a thinker. You believe the Bible. If someone says, I, I, I hold this against you, you hold the Bible as true, I hope you would say, yeah, you can hold that against me. I do. Beginning to end, this is the word of God. But, but people might try to use that against you. Someone might say, oh, oh you know, she's faithful to her spouse or he's faithful to his spouse. What a weakness. Wouldn't it be great if what people thought was bad about you is how faithful you were to your spouse and to your children if you're married and if you have a family? I know a business guy who told me, he said, I'm limited in how I can do business, particularly when I travel to certain parts of the world, did a lot of international work. He said, I'm limited because when I go to other parts of the world, I will not go to the brothels, I will not go to prostitutes with the business people I'm working with. I say I'm going to stay at my room at night, I'm going to check in with my wife, and I'm going to sleep. Maybe have, my, maybe have a little Bible study. And they hold that against me, and he's, I'm actually held back in some of my business dealings because I won't do what is immoral. Praise God if someone says, your problem is you're too faithful to your wife. You're too faithful to your husband. But people can use that against you. If you're one of those people who says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him, that the way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. You're, you're not a pluralist that says any religion is, it works and they're all the same, but you say Jesus Christ himself said he's the way to heaven, I believe that he is. Now, he's, he's made the way open for everybody who will believe, but he is the way, the truth, and the life. Some will say you are closed-minded, you are unloving, you're a hate monger. I've had people say that of me. I've had, I've had actually... Christians who don't really believe the Bible and say that they're still Christians get on my case because I actually believe the Bible's true and Jesus is the only way. I can live with that and I hope that you could too. If somebody says, you always tell the truth, you're always trustworthy, that's your weakness, then okay, let that be your weakness. I have a friend who was on our church board actually in Michigan and became, was a friend for years and he was one of these people that just had integrity and commitment to the truth and he wouldn't compromise. And there were people in the business, he was a business guy, people in the business world that would use that to manipulate him because they knew he would always tell the truth. This guy actually, the company he ran, his father had owned. And his father went bankrupt years before. And when he went bankrupt, he couldn't pay a lot of the people he owed debt to. This man that I knew went back a number of years later and he tracked back to every person his dad owed money to. And he did all he could to pay back every one of those people. Legally, he didn't have to. Legally, his dad didn't have to pay him back. He certainly didn't have to pay him back. But you want to believe that everyone in that business community that heard when this guy went and paid back everybody money that his dad owed them, that he didn't have to pay them? Man, that established him as a man of integrity and character. But there were still people that tried to use that integrity against him. That's what's going on here in the book of Daniel. So here's, here's what I call a discouraging reality. We're talking about how do you battle against and stand strong against discouragement. Here's a discouraging reality. Sometimes your faithfulness to God will be used against you. Sometimes your, your, your commitment to Jesus Christ, your faithfulness to the word of God, and your commitment to walk in the ways of God, people will try to manipulate that and use that against you. And we just have to say, okay, if, I, if I'm gonna have something used against me, I'd love to have it be the fact that I'm committed to God and I don't compromise. So we continue on in the passage of verse 6. And this is what I call a plot, a plan, and a pushover. And we find out that Darius is not thinking ahead, and he kind of gets, he becomes a pushover in this story. Verse 6. So the administrators and satraps went as a group to the king. And they said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue a decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Do you see what's going on here? This group of leaders comes together, and they say, King, you're so wonderful. And you know, we, we all see King sort of as divine. So how, how, about, how about we just make everyone worship and pray to only you for a set period of time in a certain way just to show their devotion to you. Now they know what they're doing. 
They know Daniel's character. They know his lifestyle of prayer and his diligence. They know he won't compromise. And because they can't find anything in his business practice to go after, they go after his faith. They go after his prayer life. He prays to Yahweh, the God of heaven. He does it three times a day. He does it consistently and faithfully and publicly. And they know it. And here's what else they know. He won't stop doing it. Because that's who he is. And do people know that about us? That we stand on our faith and we will never compromise. They knew that about Daniel, and so they leveraged it against him, and then Darius falls for their ploy. He falls for their trick because he knows that when, for the Medes and the Persians, when they put something in writing as a law, it could not be taken back. They could create new laws that might counter those laws, but they couldn't remove a law. And so they basically are trying to corner the king. By the way, bold move, bad idea. By the time the story is done, you'll discover that, even as I discover that as I read the text. It, it's a bold, bad idea. So they're, they're saying, listen, let's do this. And he says, let's go for it. So they move forward. And, and I, I want to just give a word. Beware. Beware when someone comes to you and, or a group comes to you and says to you, we have got a great plan for your life. You are so wonderful. You're so smart. You're so amazing. You're so gifted. What if you, the, the minute people start coming to you and flattering you and tell you their great plan for your life, I would just tell you, just hit the pause button, baby, and step back and say, hold on a minute. Is there something behind this? They might be altruistic and pure in their thinking, but they might not be. And when a person or a group starts praising you and lifting you up and appealing to pride and saying, what about this? It would make you look so good. Be very, very careful. So here's the next thing we need to understand. Other people's bad behavior, jealousy, and resentment can cost us. This is the real world. We have to face the fact that other people can do things that are difficult, that cost us, and we've got to, we've got to learn to just kind of deal with that reality. If we look and say, every time somebody else does something that impacts us in an adverse way, if we go, the world's not fair. Guess what? The world is not fair. And, and I, I saw, some years ago, uh, a, a TV uh, show host, Conan O'Brien, did the commencement speech for Dartmouth College. And it's funny, it's thoughtful. I, like, I love watching speeches. Of all, I love, particularly, I love watching funny people do speeches. I, I learn a lot from them and how they think and how they express things. And in this speech, he goes on in the speech to, to tell people, and I'm, I'm going to read it for you. I can't capture the way he did, but here's what he says to all these students there. He says to these students, my first job as your commencement speaker is to illustrate that life is not fair. For example, you have worked tirelessly to earn the diploma you are earning this weekend. Dartmouth is giving me the same degree for interviewing the fourth lead in Twilight. And then he says, deal with it. Because I'm getting the same degree you get for doing interviews. It's life. Deal with it. Then he says this, another example that life is not fair. If it does rain, the powerful rich people on the stage get the tent and you get soaked. Deal with it. And in a sense, when we read Daniel's story, we realize sometimes other people make bad choices, do poor things, and it impacts us. And we can stand and, and scream at heaven and complain, but what we have to do is ultimately say, I'm going to deal with it, that that's life. Human lives are interconnected, and what other people do, does at times will impact me, and I will impact them. That's part of life. As we continue on in the passage in verse 10, we enter a part of the text I call an unwavering life of worship and then being trapped by faithfulness. So, so Daniel lived a life of unwavering worship and because he was so faithful and so consistent, he gets trapped in his own faithfulness. Again, a terrible thing, but what better thing to be trapped by being faithful to Jesus? I mean, it's the best way to live your life. So we continue on in verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room Listen to this. Where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. He didn't push them closed so nobody would notice what he's doing. The windows are, op windows are open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. He didn't change his practice. He didn't change his lifestyle. Three times a day, on his knees, talking to God. Verse 11. Then these men went as a group. They snuck up. They found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So then they ran to the king to tattletale. They're like children. 
They went to see what was going on. So then they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Now watch what happens. They are so manipulative. They go to the king. King, did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except you, your majesty, would be thrown to the lion's den? They're like, didn't we vaguely remember? Wasn't there, wait, yeah. Wasn't there some decree? I mean, they suggested it. They manipulated it. They planned it. And then he goes, they didn't. We can't really, wasn't there some? And so the king responds. The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. And this is what I call the, then they go, gotcha. Watch what happens. Then they said to the king, Daniel, you know, the one you want to put over the whole kingdom because you so, this elderly man who is so wise and so faithful and so consistent, who we hate so much. Well, they said, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. Gotcha, king. Nothing you can do about it. Man, they are playing a dangerous game. And it's going to cost them. It's going to cost them. But at this point, they think they've now won. So Daniel, he knew the edict. He knew the consequences. He went upstairs. He had his windows open. And three times a day, as he had done before, he prayed to God. That's consistency. Man, I think sometimes for us, when, when, when there might be a cost to what we're doing, to how we're living, for some of us, we, we kind of want to maybe just kind of gently close those shutters on the window. You know, I'll, just make, I'll just keep this between me and Jesus. Nobody else has to. I'll just kind of close the window. I'll close the shutters. I'll play it safe. Daniel didn't do that. I wonder for us, when are we tempted to not mention that we love Jesus? To kind of downplay the fact that we believe the Bible is the word of God. When are, when are we tempted to just kind of, kind of gloss over, to gently close the shutters of our heart, of our life, of the windows of our faith, so no one will notice? Daniel wouldn't do that. Because he loved God, prayer was part of his life, so, so he just presses forward. Here's what we learn. We can do exactly the right thing and have it turn against us. Do you understand that? Do you understand that you can follow God faithfully, do exactly the right things, know his will for your life, step into it, and, and God says, well done, good and faithful servant, but other people might say, gotcha, and might be cornering you in some way. We can do the right things and pay the consequences. We have to be aware of that and prepared for that. That's part of walking with and following Jesus. Daniel was okay with that, and he kept pressing forward. I think of when Jesus said, blessed are you when people persecute you for my name's sake. Jesus told us, you will be blessed even when you're persecuted if you do it for righteousness sake. If you're living for Jesus, following him, and you get persecuted, he says, there's a blessing in that. Man, we have a hard time thinking that way. We live in a day and an age in the church where a lot of people will think, man, if I follow Jesus and do what he wants, everything should go my way. And I should always be flush with cash and healthy and happy. And there's even preachers that will tell you that. But you look, at the, you look at the most noble and faithful characters in the Bible and almost every single one of them had moments of pain and difficulty and suffering for following God. So let's not believe the lie that if I just follow Jesus, everything goes my way. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, if you follow me, you get to take a cross and lay your life down every day. Does that sound like fun? And it's glorious, it's meaningful, but it's not fun. It's hard at times. And all the faithful people in the Bible who really followed God learned this lesson, that you can do exactly the right thing, and sometimes it can turn against you. The next part of the passage as we continue walking through Daniel chapter 6 is what I call trapped and trapped. And what is, ends up happening is Daniel gets trapped and Darius the king gets trapped. And all of this, and, and this is sort of like, like, a, like a double trapped kind of a scenario. When they did this, now the king was stuck by his own laws and Daniel is now under the consequence of those laws. So we continue on in verse 14. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. When he realized, oh my gosh, what have I done? I signed this law. He, you know that the king knew that they knew what they were doing. You knew at that point he was already frustrated with them, if, if not outraged. But right now he's just trying to think about Daniel because he, he, he respects this guy. He wants to make him number two in his kingdom. He's ascended at the highest points of leadership. Here's this, this godly, trustworthy, elderly, faithful guy who's been serving for about 60 years. And now they've cornered him to where he has to execute him and throw him to the lions. 
So the king, when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. He tried to find some way around his own laws, but he couldn't change his own laws. The men went as a group to the king, to King Darius, and they said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. They now have the king trapped and cornered. They have Daniel trapped and cornered. The king can't stop it. Daniel's about to be executed and thrown to the lions. And they're loving this moment. They have played their hand perfectly, so it, th so it seems. Now, if you've been doing our reading and you've read ahead, you know it doesn't end well for them. But at this moment, they think, we win. Daniel's going to be killed. We get to ascend to higher positions of authority and we'll have him out of the way. Verse 16, so the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, I love this, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. Daniel, I hope your God can rescue you. You serve him continually. I know your character. I know who you are. I pray that he rescues you. And at this point, it seems like the story's over. Daniel's thrown in the lion's den. These lions are kept hungry. These lions are ferocious. These lions want dinner, and Daniel appears to be their dinner. Now just pause for a minute and think about moments in your own life. What are those moments that you feel trapped? Where you feel like, man, I didn't try to get myself here. I was trying to live for the Lord, but all of a sudden, I'm trapped. I'm cornered. You might feel that right now. I'm trapped. I didn't create this virus. I didn't... I uh, want this virus. I didn't want my job to change. I didn't want to be sheltering at home. I didn't want to wear some goofy mask. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to do any of this stuff. But here I am. How do you respond when you feel trapped? And man, I want to encourage you to look to God in those moments. To look to God. Because he knows your situation. He knows you. And he's still with you. And Daniel learned this. And we can ask, where are you feeling trapped right now? And at those moments, don't turn your back on God, but turn your face toward him and say, God, help me and deliver me or at least be with me as I walk through this. Here's the next lesson. In moments we feel trapped, trust in God even more. I want to challenge you in those moments to place your trust in God even more. Even right now in your heart to say, God, I'm feeling trapped in this situation. I'm feeling trapped being out of work or I'm feeling trapped in the job I'm in or I'm feeling trapped in this, in, you know, whatever it is, in this economy, whatever it is, and say, God, in the midst of feeling trapped, help me trust you even more than I ever have before. The passage goes on to what I call a long, hard night. Verse 17. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. Daniel's thrown in. They put a stone over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, meaning that nobody could change it or touch it and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. He is locked in till morning. From every human standpoint, he's dead. The story is over. Verse 18. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating, without any entertainment, being brought to him, and he could not sleep. The king was restless. He stayed up all night long, concerned for Daniel. At the first light of the dawn, because that's what the edict said, that's what the law said. When the first light came up, they could open up the lion's den. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried into the lion's den, to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? you pause. And are you still there? Are you, are you still alive? Has this God, and I love how he says again, the God you serve continually. You're on your knees three times a day praying. I know who you are. And, and then here's just this, this reality. That, that, and, and, and I won't tell you quite yet how the story ends. You might know. You might have heard how the story ends. But here, here's a reality we have to face. There are moments in life when Daniel's thrown into the lion's den. We don't know what's happening. He's in this moment of waiting. He's got a whole night in the lion's den. And, 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 and we, we know that God is watching over him, but he's in this horrible, painful, long-term situation. It's one of those times where seconds feel like hours and hours feel like days. And, and, and there, there's, there's a lesson that I, I think is important. And I want to, there's sometimes, I'm trying to think of the right way to word this. There's some moments in life where we're in a really hard situation where we have to wait and just say, I'm going to wait and I'm going to live with it. 
I just got to live in it and live with it, and I got to wait. It's hard, it's painful. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait to see what God does. You're waiting on a diagnosis, and there's nothing you can do about it. So I'm just going to wait on the Lord and be patient and keep trusting. Your spouse is deployed, and you don't know when they're coming back again. I need to wait and trust in the Lord and keep crying out to him. You're in a financial situation where you're in a job you don't want to be in or you want to have a job and you don't or there's financial struggles. Yeah, I, there's times where I just have to, I'll do all I can, but I, I'm doing everything I can. Nothing's changing right now. I have to wait and trust in the Lord and wait on him. Waiting for the economy to open up. Waiting for them to say, you could open, they're going to open up your work again. Sometimes you just say, I'm going to wait on the Lord and trust in him in the midst of all of this. And here's another lesson. God is with you in the long, hard nights, days, and seasons of life. In those long, painful, difficult times, remember God is with you. That we encounter God, we draw near to God, oftentimes most powerfully and most closely in the hard moments of life. And through a time like this with a COVID-19 situation where we're waiting and it's hard, do we turn our back on God or do we just keep drawing near God and drawing near to God and knowing he's with us in what we're facing? When we're waiting, uh, a, a spouse who's, who's wandered away and who's distanced from us, a child who's wandering that we love and we're waiting and crying out to God, those moments can bring us closer to God sometimes than anything else and put our full trust in him. And so the king says, Daniel, are you there? Are you still alive? And we pick up in verse 21 with what I call a joyful ending, although this is not quite the end of the story yet, but a joyful ending. Daniel answered, may the king live forever, because that's how you talk to kings. My God sent his angel, his messenger, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed. And gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Now let me be clear. I am not trying to say that the Bible is teaching that if we walk in God's will, we'll never get a scratch on us, we'll never have a problem. That's not what this is teaching us. But in this circumstance, there are times where God will deliver that way and have you come out without a scratch on you. Praise God for those moments. Sometimes like the Apostle Paul, who was strapped up five times and given the 40 lashes less one, sometimes we bear the scars of our faithfulness. Sometimes God takes us out unscratched. Both of those are opportunities to grow in our faith and to walk with our God. I'd rather have the ones where you're pulled out unscratched, but in both of those, God is still with us. I wonder if someone was to ask you, could you tell a story about a time that God sent his angels to watch over you? A time that you know in the midst of a painful, difficult time, a complicated situation, you look back and you say, I don't know what happened, but I know God was with me. I know he was watching over me. I know he was protecting me. I could tell stories in my life of where I go, man, if God hadn't intervened, it would have gone so badly. Remember those moments. Celebrate those moments. So here's another lesson. To look, notice, and celebrate God's presence in discouraging times. How do you stand strong in times of discouragement? Remember the other times when God carried you through, where God delivered you, where God showed up and was with you in the midst of the difficult time in the lion's den. Celebrate those times that God was with you in discouraging times so you're encouraged for the future. And then there's what I call a not-so-joyful ending. For Daniel, things end very well. For these guys that had manipulated the whole situation had made all this happen. It not only cost them, and this is a brutal part of the story, it cost their wives and their children their lives. It's a different world, a different time, and this is how Darius judged them. But I, but I want to read what it says because there was huge consequences. At the king's command, these men who had falsely accused Daniel, the ones who orchestrated this entire manipulative process, were brought in and thrown in the lion's den along with their wives and their children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. That is not a a sign of how God wants people treated. It's a picture of how this king treated those who acted as his enemies. Not uncommon in the ancient world. There was consequences that were carried through an entire family. But I will say this. When people in our world, including us, do wrong, manipulative, dangerous things and get caught... It always costs more than ourselves. If I did something out of line, it will cost my wife and it will cost my kids. 
maybe in reputation, maybe in some other way. And so we've got to be careful. Sometimes we say, well, that's just my thing. It doesn't impact anybody else. It's almost never true that what we do impacts no one else. In this story, we realize that Darius was so outraged, he brought judgment on their whole family. God doesn't act that way, but God does bring justice. The God we worship is a God of justice. And I would say this, here, here at Shoreline Church, if I found out that there was a staff person who was lying and deceiving and manipulating, as the senior pastor of this church, they were deceiving and manipulating and they told lies about another person, they tried to undercut them and treat them badly and put them, put them in a bad light, and I found that out, I wouldn't go after that person's spouse and children, but in the name of Jesus, I'd go after them, that there would be consequences. You say, well, you can't have consequences for your bad behavior. Yes, you can. And God cares about that. And, and, and so we have to understand that, that we, we worship a God who actually says to us, you know, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. One of the reasons we as Christians can try to make sure that things are right and just, and for the most part, what we do is we'll say, God, I entrust this to you because God is the one who brings about justice on each person, not on their wives, not on their husband, not on their children, but on each person. And, and God loves us enough to deal with our sins and to deal with our our. our rebellion against him. And then the rest of the story, if you continue on in verse 25, then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language and all the earth, may you prosper greatly. So at the end of the story, now King Darius is, is reflecting on what he's experienced. Verse 26, I issue a decree that every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, Cyrus the Persian. So now he's just continuing on into his old age, being faithful and blessed by God. Here's one more thought. No matter how discouraging our situation, at the end of the day, God is on the throne and everyone will see it. Whatever you're walking through today, whatever I'm walking through, however you're feeling about social distancing and sheltering at home and what's happening with our economy, as hard as it may be, remember God is on the throne and there'll be a day where everyone will see it. In this life, in this time, not everyone sees it. But I love in the book of Philippians, this, this declaration, Philippians 2, 9 to 11, just listen to these words. Therefore, God exalted him, Jesus. God exalted Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins, who rose again. God exalted him to the highest place and gave him, Jesus, the name that is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There will come a day when every single person bows down before God because he is God. Even those who, who have sworn they never would, even those who were rebellious all their lives, bowing down to God at that moment doesn't mean that they're saved and put their faith in Jesus. It means they come into the presence of the Holy God and you can do nothing but bow down. And so why not bow down now? Why not learn from Daniel and just say, the rhythm of my lifestyle will be that I bow before the living God. So God, that's what we do right now. We bow before you in our homes, in our apartments, on military bases, in hotel rooms, in different, wherever we are scattered around this planet. Right now, we bow our hearts, we bow our lives. If we're able, we can bow our knees before you and worship you and praise you and follow you. And Lord, in the discouraging, heartbreaking, difficult times of life, let us remember that you are with us and you are on the throne. And let us put our trust in you and then partner with you as we walk into the lives you want us to live for your glory, Lord Jesus. We pray this. Amen. Well, before I give you a word of blessing, I want to give you a couple of invitations, things that I think will be very helpful for you. If you want prayer, if there's any aspect of your life right now, there's a joy, there's a need, there's a person you love and care about who's really hurting, an upcoming surgery, whatever it is, we want to pray with you. 
So you'll see on the screen both a phone number and also an email address. You can call us, you can email, and someone will pray with you right now. We have people waiting to pray with you. We would love to pray with you, so please let us know. Also, if you're new to Shoreline, we want to give you a proper, warm, personal welcome, and that's hard to do unless we know who you are. So if you'll just text, text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen, we will respond back, answer any questions you have, and get to know you a little bit. If you're part of Shoreline and you're wondering about when's this going to start, when's that going to start, what's coming up, are we going to do this, any questions, just go to info at shoreline.church. We'll get right back to you on that one. And then finally, in just a moment after I give a word of blessing, uh, we, we are going to have a short video. I encourage you, if you didn't watch this video at the beginning of the service, watch it right now and just kind of find out what's happening in the life of your church and maybe it'll touch you in a way that you can get engaged and more part of the life of your church. As you go from this time of worship, as you continue on into your week, if you're discouraged, if you're feeling disheartened, if you feel like you're kind of trapped in a lion's den, know that you are not alone. Know that God is with you. Declare your trust in him, your love for him. Hold his hand. And as he leads you through it, give him all the praise and the honor and the glory. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll see you soon in a morning devotional or in a Sunday service. God bless you.